Lowndes County Fire Rescue, LCFR. This <coughs> provides you with general information concerning the number of calls that our fire department uh, has had. There's a breakdown based on the total number of calls into accidents, medical, fire alarms, trees down, grass fire, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll obviously note that and, and realize that a large number of the downed trees were related to storms. Um, but if you flip over, you will see how the 2017 numbers, while significant, is certainly less than at our height when we were in 2013 at 3,500. And uh, so our level at 17 is greater than 2010, but less than 2011 up through 2016. So we've all been concerned, I think, about uh, our fire department. You heard yesterday the training facility update and uh, that we are addressing those issues very shortly. Um, the next map shows the pie chart of the call, number of calls by area for the departments uh, in those areas. You will note that uh, Bemis, North Lounge, as well as Twin Lakes are all very close in numbers. And the other departments on the right side of the pie chart Naylor, Shiloh, West Side, East Side, Clyde, and South Side are lower. Oh, um, so what is the fire department on Johnston Road? Is it on the pie chart? Is it incorporated with one of Is that the um, Johnston substation? Road? Yeah. There, I think the data is by district. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it is Which in is that area, but it's a substation of um, Southside. South yes. South. Yeah, and that probably answers quite. I was going to ask about the Mineola station. Is that a substation to West Side, or is Mineola a standalone <laughs> station? Or is um, Mineola, North Lounge? Yeah, Mineola belongs to North Lounge. North Lounge. If you uh, turn to the next page, you'll see a breakdown based on districts. Your uh, primary one, two, three districts, and then your uh, two countywide districts, and the associated number of fires. Mark, please people to quit calling the fire department so much. Um, your next sheet shows the uh, type of apparatus at the, uh, that the county has, how many uh, tankers, uh, average age of the equipment. Uh, so we have some that we're, we've already ordered one. We will be receiving bumper this year um, and each year that we go through our budget I look at the department uh, with the amount of equipment, the age of the equipment, the maintenance costs associated with that particular uh, apparatus versus uh, the use. So if we look at, if we're looking at a department that has fewer calls, we try to evaluate that, that uh, usefulness of that piece of equipment uh, <coughs> and the amount of money involved in the repairs and or replacement. Uh, obviously, we try to provide those that are the most, uh, secure, most
most secure for the users from a safety standpoint, but it's important to note that uh, these items are not cheap and we try to do as good a job as we possibly can in maintaining those. You can imagine, um, I know it's this way with EMS vehicles, if you take that out to a mechanic who normally does not work on that type of apparatus, there's a lot of wires in that EMS and a lot of uh, equipment that has to function properly. Uh, so it's not just a matter of uh, simple repairs and maintenance. And the same thing is true to a little bit lesser degree with fire risk as well. Any, uh, any particular questions y'all want on the fire rescue that we can or information you'd like us to get for you concerning usage. Joe, okay, what's an what's an air truck and an aerial apparatus? Aerial is the ladder. The air actually is, has a fan motor on it. That fills the. No, it fills bottles. Yeah. The, the oh, okay. Okay. All it's right. one of the things we were roll most often. Sometimes we enjoy. We've got one. If you get somebody in, that goes in and they're oxygen in the tank, then you got to replace that, get somebody else in there, you got to fill up the tank. So, so you need that capability. So even though, not necessarily the reserve pumper, but even though the life, average life of a tanker in this air truck is in excess of 20 years, they're still, they're, they're still functioning. It's just the maintenance cost sure. may be higher, but not warrant the cost of purchasing in that Yeah, and, you know, having an aerial truck, I think one of the big, biggest driving factors behind the purchase of an aerial truck was to be able to address wild adventures from the standpoint of equipment breakdown and being able to get people from there as well as PCA. Those were kind of the two that makes sense. And, and PCA has been a great corporate citizen in support of the fire department. The, the side of the new, or the station that's there in Clyde was uh, donated by PCA. And they, we have never had any question of support or cooperation with PCA. Well, let's, uh, if y'all don't mind, let's, I'd like to get some input. Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper because I think one of the key services that we as a commission have a responsibility is public safety to the citizens. In my opinion, fire rescue is a big, is a big part of that, uh, even though it is basically kind of stand alone. We've had, we've had some discussions for quite a while about the need or the desire to have additional uh, professional firemen, paid firemen. Um, and what would facilitate that, of course, is having a different presence in another paid fire station. We now have one on the east side, which is the main fire station, about doing one either on the west side or the northwest side based on what growth areas and those sort of things may dictate. So, where, where, where are your thoughts at and what are your desires as far as what you'd like to see as we move forward? And I'm sure Paige is going to want to kind of include this in some of her information. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of her while she's trying to get set up. But just kind of open it up for some discussion on that issue. My first question is, um, where are we with the fire chief? Yeah. We got one, don't we? We have an interim fire chief. Um, uh, we, um, 
<laughs> Ashley's doing a good job in uh, filling in as the interim in that position. Um, I have uh, given serious consideration to where we go forward. Uh, I've given, uh, y'all know that we have advertised on at least two occasions and conducted interviews uh, with individuals that to this stage and to this point, we have not found a candidate that I feel comfortable in that position. We have had some knowledgeable uh, individuals, but one of the most important things is not only their knowledge, but also their chemistry and working well in this community and with complexity of a volunteer-based fire system as well as a uh, professional paid uh, system. That is not an easy task to be able to find somebody that can do both of those. So um, there is a little bit of a, a natural competitiveness between um, volunteers versus uh, paid staff. Um, so that has to be the right chemistry for that individual to be successful and provide the highest level of service to uh, both. Uh, frankly, we have, uh, we have struggled with that on a couple of occasions. We have been either fish or fowl. We have not found somebody that really relates to us in a professional manner that we would like. And it's obvious that as our community continues to grow in its size and, and its uh, complexity, we will be forced to look more to a professional or pace. But our community is such we will not be able to, I don't think, certainly in the foreseeable future, be able to rely on a fully paid staff to provide the level of service. So uh, I hope to have something to y'all in conjunction with the budget as to a solution to this problem or situation. I don't feel like I know enough and am educated enough to, to really even comment other than to say that just generally with what I do know, first I don't, I don't like us going long term with an interim fire chief. I think we, it needs to be at the top of our priority list and on our radar to try to resolve that. And the little bit of feedback that I've gotten from the few in the fire business that I've acquaintances or whatever seems to be possibly as much about the pay as it is the challenges of having a volunteer staff and the coordination and all that goes behind that. So my question is, how, do, how does our fire chief position compare to others pay from a pay scale? I mean, are, are, we, are we trying to, to acquire somebody for too little money? Is that, is that really what it boils down to, or is it just... I don't really it? think so. When you evaluate our pay system uh, that we have, and, and we have discussed this on a number of occasions, that our uh, pay scale is recommended to us by Lowson Associates. I'm sorry. Condry. Condry uh, and Associates, and they are the same firm that has, the same individuals, that has provided this service since I've been here. They've been the uh, city of Valdosta as well, and numerous other uh, cities and counties. So just as uh, we have done in the past, we will evaluate all of these positions again this year when we look at uh, budgets, and we will I've already asked Kevin to get from Los, 
from Condry and Associates uh, an assessment of where we are in comparison to similar sized counties as well as those comparable to the private sector and to uh, our sister government, City of Alabama. The uh, issues that I have encountered, quite frankly, has not been based on salary, um, or certainly I'm not aware of it if it's been based on salary. I mean, we've had some, uh, I think, comparable individuals, uh, capable individuals. But again, uh, when we actually sat down, met with them, talked to them, um, it was just some things that were missing. I think that was true for every individual that was involved in the selection process, that nobody came away with uh, a consensus that this is the individual we need. To the contrary, it was almost to a person. We haven't hit it right yet. If you've got any comment, you were involved in most of those meetings. Well, I just want to make sure I hadn't wore out my comment card talking about and exactly. Uh, Since when does that matter? Yeah, he's never stopped you before. So. I, I think one thing, if you, and, and I'm, I'm looking at it, you might say, as an outsider trying to look in. Uh, and I used, the term, I used the terminology a while ago, and I used it probably incorrectly and wrong when I said a professional partner. We have to understand, number one, that a, and the term should really be a career fireman. A career fireman versus a firefighter. A career firefighter versus a volunteer firefighter. They both have the equal and same training. I mean, the, the training is not an, an issue. So it's just one that chose the route to go down the, to make that a career. Your issue with what you say, I believe, Scotty, from the standpoint of some of your comments, but I've talked to some of the volunteers as well. I have a volunteer fireman that works for me. Uh, he can't leave me making what he makes for a career at this point in his life to go and work for Lowndes County as a career fireman. He can't make the same amount of money. Now, again, those are career choices that we make if we move along. Now, that there, it's easy for young people that's looking to get entry level and get a career to get involved and go to work for the county and then decide that that's what they want their career to be. Uh, but it's different to have someone that's already out here in the workforce, has a trade, has a job, has a profession, whatever the case may be, and then to think that that individual can transition into a career fireman because it probably doesn't match from a, an income level. So there are some issues with that. So, And, and I, I think until we ever get to the point, if we ever do, that we have a full-time paid force. And I'm going to go back to what I believe Mr. Pritchard's information was earlier at previous meetings, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think just to man, to man a fire station, we were probably looking at a minimum of 15 employees. 12 to 15. Yeah, to man a fire station. Um, so then do you man that fire station 24-7, or do you try to do it part Well, if you do it part-time, you really haven't accomplished That's anything. Right. If the fire happens when they're off duty, same as a volunteer. Same as a volunteer. Well, well I, can I, just a couple of things, going back to the, the hiring. I, I think Mr. Richard's right. I think that the devil in the detail is the challenge that you have in hiring a fire chief for a combination department. And just like a lot of things that we've talked about, that's not specific. We're not special in that. That happens to all combination departments. And, you know, a chief is someone who's had experience in the fire service, so you're going to get them um, from one discipline to the other. They're going to be either a little heavier experience on the volunteer side or on the paid side. <clears throat> but I think that, that part of the message that we send regarding that service, and sometimes you don't know unless you, you've been in it, um, is as simple as the use of the word career. 
because whenever you have volunteers who have families that have been part of Clarence County Fire Rescue for generations, that you've got people like we saw someone the other night that had been a volunteer for over 30 years. To him and to his family, that is a career. That's not, and, and I think that sometimes we don't realize that, that they see it that way. And I know, Mr. Chairman, what you're referring to is a household sustained income, that being your primary. But the other thing to remember is that because of the nature of how they work, again, it's primary and secondary. Because a volunteer is going to have a primary job, and being a volunteer is going to be secondary. The only difference with a paid firefighter is that the fire department is their primary, but they all have second jobs. They work three to four days a week, and then they all go to another job. So but it's a second job. It's is not their, their primary job. Right. So it's, you know, one, just like it, you got to find that balance with, with the fire chief, it's the balance with, um, with those firefighters as well. I would, I would look at it a little bit different when you look at a 12-hour shift. Um, I think if you man a 12-hour shift during that time when those secondary paid or secondary firefighters, if you want to call that, those volunteers are at their primary job, you have, a, you have enhanced the coverage at that time in that area. At night, you have those volunteers that are much more available, generally speaking, to cover those hours. It's during those times when they are working other places. So we have looked at, because we knew we couldn't, we couldn't afford going to a 24-hour uh, man station, how would we do this? Well, we would go to a 12-hour shift, and we might add one, one station. We might add two stations in addition to our uh, primary full-paid <clears throat> station. Uh, then we may make one of those two 12-hour shifts a 24 and then we may make the third one 24. Uh, just like looking at those pie charts, if you looked at those three primary areas and you're, you're plotting it on that map, you're looking at their connectivity from roadways, but you're also looking at uh, what fire calls are in those areas. So you look and say, well, with a 12-hour shift, on the, at the Bema station be more beneficial to us and cost effective than going out and put something out near Kindle because you got two, you got a balance on east and west. Or if you look at north and south, not just geographically, but also based on uh, those calls and what you can do with those areas. I think if if we were sitting down with a fire chief, that would be that would be their recommendation. If I gave them a task and said, "We want to go to a higher level of service, but we have constraints of our cost," what would what would be your recommendation? I would say that probably 85 percent of those with those constraints would go to a 12-hour shift. Now. I know the chairman and I have discussed this, and he disagrees with that. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm not saying the other's right. I'm just saying it is another way of looking at this. How many fire stations do we have? Bam. Ready? There you go. I'm about to make all your mapping dreams come true. <laughs> I have been excited about this for a couple of weeks, and we've held back because it's still ongoing. But it's something that we want to um, make available to you all again on those tablets if you choose to approve those in the budget for us to move forward. Um, this is the product of um, input from um, several of our departments. And this is the talent of the Regional Commission. Rachel Strom and her staff worked with us to put this together. 
So, if you would like to know where the fire stations are, there they are. If you would like to know where our fire calls were in 2017, here's where it's going to get interesting. Bam! So, if you would like to just take a look at the unincorporated areas, let me remove the municipal boundaries. And you can look at this specifically per commission district. And if you want to look at, let's get the cities off of there. All right, so now we're just looking at the unincorporated. Now, what's what happens whenever we overlay EMS on top of that? Now, let's add the cities back. Look where the primary EMS calls are. And so now, whenever you're talking about planning for the ambulance services and things like that, um, let's take a look at the unincorporated, just unincorporated again, and take the fire calls off and look at the EMS calls. I know my head's are out You're good. That's fine. No problem. Just turn that computer. So, what it says is, is that we do have some areas of concentration, but primarily it's all over the county. And the um, where it gets a little better because I know that there are um, there are locations, for instance, just with the fire department that you guys have talked about adding, um, you know, maybe a station or improving a station in the north end of the county. <clears throat> And so, whenever you drill down, I'll take a minute to catch up. You can take a look at where the fire calls really are, and you can get as deep into that as you would like. Um, for instance, here's the north line like the needs to be in the north central part of the county. <clears throat> um, Yes, sir. Until you get far enough that you can look at south part of the county. And we've got some pockets down in the south end that are... Um, just as populated. No fires in much swamp. But if you look at this area down in here, you're just as heavy as you are here. Um, one thing that this does not point out, um, because we've not drilled the data down enough to look at it, is really where your rescue calls are going. And I think, Mr. Pritchard, in your conversation with some of the district chiefs, um, as well as the fire chiefs, are one of our big needs is for rescue. Um, you saw how many blue calls we had with the EMS Where, calls. Where's our main fire department? Right there? We're headquarters right here. Okay. That's why those that pie chart just follows that location. But we run more medical and more grass fire calls than we do actual structure fire calls. All right, let me, let me, look, I want to address, without getting too far away from subject matter, but because you brought it up there, EMS calls. Um, look at them. Right. All right. Those are EMS calls that's ran by... Lowndes County Fire Rescue? Yes, this data came... Not the South Georgia no, this Ambulance da, Center? No, this is the ambulance calls. But there's these. this came from South Georgia Medical Center's data. Okay. Um, but there, there is duplication there um, because there are some calls that we are also dispatched on, just like the Sheriff's Office is dispatched along with animal control and those aggressive dog complaints. Code Blues wrote, rolled the fire department as well. Okay. Accidents. 
structure fires, you're going to see EMS come out on structure fire because right. then they're to support, they're they're there to support right. the fire. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I get that, but and I don't want this to get all tangled up and, and missed and confused, but are we are we duplicating calls unnecessarily because we roll county EMS along with South Georgia Medical Center that we also support? No, it's the same EMS. We only have, it's only one. But Are you talking about rolling the fire truck and the ambulance? Rolling the, rolling the county's medical call. There's only, so there's, there's not a difference. A medical call only belongs to EMS, uh -huh. but protocol requires a lot of those things for the fire department to be dispatched on as well. So, for instance, an accident, mm -hmm. you're going to have patients, even if you only have one patient, a lot of times it takes the fire department and their protective gear to get all the stuff related to the accident away so that the patient can be brought out and loaded. Well, extraction and, and all then they go, you, right. you got two separate responsibilities. Okay. Yeah. Actually, there's three. Law enforcement controls the area of the accident. Getting the traffic stop, getting people out of the way, etc. <laughs> they have to do that in order to get emergency responders in there. The firemen go in, and they their responsibility is maintaining the vehicle, or let's say it's a vehicle, as far as gaining access for the patient. The EMS is there to respond to the patient. Without the fire, the EMS may not be able to gain access. If you don't have law enforcement there, you've got a chaos that's going to create another accident. So it takes all three of those to be involved. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, we had a situation where somebody said, I don't need an ambulance going to, uh, or fire truck going to every scene. Don't need it. Duplication. Somebody has an accident. Law enforcement gets there. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I, I'm hurting. My stomach's hurting. And then they start to fall out. Well, what's happened? Well, they've got internal bleeding. They're bleeding out. There's no visible sign, but the law enforcement guy's going, dang, it hates to be you. Um, uh, but I'm controlling the, the, the traffic area. That's all I know to do. Well, where's the ambulance? Well, you probably better call them. If you've got all of those converging on that scene, you're able to address it. It may be just they get there and go, yep, we don't need to do anything, get the patient out, and then once the patient's gone, fire looks at what needs to be done to the area for the roadway. Is there fluid spills, or there's something like that that we need to clean up, and then we'll get back on the traffic. So it's a, it's a multiple response, and Paige in the previous life has, you know, been a firefighter, so she can... But for point of clarification, and I, I understand that and I agree with it, but just for point of clarification, we don't run a South Georgia Medical Center ambulance and a medical truck from the fire station to the same call. Yes, because they have different roles there. So we don't have any of we, our. Do we transport? No, no, no. Yeah, that's and what we I mean. don't have. We don't have any of our trucks yeah, that are set up. I know, and that's really I wanted to make that clear that we don't do that. But the reason why, I mean, the, the blue dots are EMS calls that involves an automobile accident. For example, that would you could possibly well you got to have law enforcement, then you got to have fire rescue for extraction if that's a possibility, and then you got to have the ambulance service to do transport if required. Yeah, I mean, and I was confused about that too because yeah. fire rescue, Lowndes County Fire Rescue, is not there to serve an ambulance service. No. They're, now, they're not there to deal with the medical and to transport. They're just there to make is, sure that the roads get clean. Get out right, so skills. this is where you hear war story overlap because after everybody's run a good call, they want to tell you about it. And so this is what happens. 
We are trained um, as Firefighter 1 or if you've got the Georgia Volunteer Certification um, through the state, then there is a component of that that is medical training. But basically it is, um, you know, being able to make a record of basic vital signs, um, holding pressure, um, knowing how to assist EMS if someone has to be C-spined and put on a backboard. Um, that's pretty much it. There's, they can put a mandate on if there's some on the truck, but we are not under a medical director, nor do they have the level of training that allows their, the care that they can provide to go beyond that. I just want so, to make that clear that that right. and I understand. Yeah. I just want to make sure that everybody was really clear well, that it is two different calls. Give it give you an example. We have two vehicles involved. The ambulance is on its way, fire truck gets there, and uh, two of the guys out of a three man staff are gaining access to one of the patients. EMS rolls and there's two people that are hurt, one in one uh, vehicle, well, three. One in one vehicle, two in the other. The EMTs are going to those individuals that are that they have triaged to determine which is the most severe. One of the firemen who has medical training that, that he, as part of his fire training, goes and provides a higher level of first aid res or first responder response until a next ambulance can get there to provide that higher level of service. That is, I won't say it happens all the time, but it's fairly frequent uh, that you have that type of level of service so that you've got more than just compartmentalized that it may appear to be. Frequently also we'll have patients um, on an accident that are um, in such bad shape that it takes both of those medical care providers that arrived in the cab of that ambulance in the back of the ambulance. So we have our firefighters um, that can drive those ambulances to the hospital. That happens a lot. Um, the other thing that happens a lot that is one of the reasons that it's important to look at all this blue is that our numbers get down um, every single day almost where the ambulances are all tied up on calls. Um, so I think that you all will see a request that there'll be some conversations with the hospital and Mr. Pritchard and the chairman over you know, what additional resources does the ambulance service need. Um, because knowing that there's a wreck that just happened and all the ambulances are already tied up is something that adds probably one of the highest levels of stress to the fire department and to law enforcement because they know that they're about to arrive on scene and that it's going to be bad and that there's very little that they can do about it until an ambulance gets there. And it's very, it, it's not as easy as you would think as far as dropping someone off at the hospital. You've got to go back there and sanitize that ambulance. You've got to resupply what you can before you can go again. It's not a situation where you can just throw them out the back at the hospital and turn and burn somewhere else. You've got to go in with that patient and update the medical staff on what their vitals are and you know there's a, a process to that. Look at the number of red calls that are outside of Lance, I mean the blue calls that are outside of Lance Camp. Yeah. When that ambulance is down there on the run. In Fargo. You know how long it takes them to go from where they are to there north. and get back. That depending on that the issue that's going to be a, a considerable call that that one unit is out of service. Yeah. But if you begin to look at this, and we had some discussion of it, okay, well, does it make sense to do like some communities and then you go to a joint fire EMS service? Well, if you talked earlier about the complexity between <coughs> full-time service, firefighter, and volunteer, now you throw in the mixture of the EMS. EMS, some EMS guys, they don't care about doing the fire. Some fire don't want to do EMS. Now all of them know more than the other one does. 
but when you start looking at this and you start trying to combine all of those, you are talking about some serious money and some serious issues in having the general <coughs> operations under one person to do that. And, and, you really got it complex. Now. And to talk about how things can relate, and I'm going to turn this over to you, Mr. Chairman, broadband. I know that you've had some of those conversations about the medical capabilities that are available with broadband if we could get it. Because when there's an ambulance in cargo, if they had some of the technology that is available now on that ambulance, if we had broadband, then the doctor at the hospital could already be looking at that patient in the back of the ambulance and authorizing treatment in that hour. Well, that's huge, but we don't have it. And until we get better broadband service throughout the rural areas of the state, uh, that's not a tool that we have in our belt that we want to continue to be able to work with. Certainly, it's another one of those things that we as commissioners can continue to advocate for it under the gold dome is, is to try to make sure that that does happen. But I don't want to, let's, let's try to do this for the sake of the discussion. Let's separate the two because I think at the present time the two are separate. They are hard. Let's look at fire. All right. Based on what you see here, even though it's scattered out all over the Lowndes County, the, the three high concentration areas are the Bemis Carter, Bemis area up there, and North Lowndes. Sorry, North Lowndes area. North Lowndes area, and then the South Twin Lakes. area down here toward uh, Twin Lakes. That area down there. Um, so, based on the services that we're currently able to provide, and I've got to come back to staff to say, <laughs> do you feel like at this point in time right now? that the citizens in Lambs County are being best served with the one fire station? Best I know it's a loaded served. question. No, I, they're not best served by one fire station. But if I see this, then we're basically looking at, down the road at some point, three fire stations. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that our I don't think our brick and mortar, if you're talking about fire stations, is really the issue. I think it really goes back to the personnel conversation that we were having and manning those stations that we already have. One of the one of the areas that's not um, that doesn't show up as a high, as high of a concentration area is this area right here, and we have con consistently heard from the firefighters in this area that we need more resource on this side of 84 because you've got all of this is probably mostly accident and we got some real bad accidents through there and depending on the traffic and the trains and everything else they can have a hard time getting out right. of that area. Based on your data and I'm sorry but based on your data can you drip it down to actual, actually fire calls? Fire calls versus accidents? Versus accidents. There, yeah. We could. Not on this map. Not on this map. Yeah. But this uh, Bemis has sleeping capabilities. So does Clyde. Okay. So if you say, where can we put somebody <coughs> immediately, you could go right here mm -hmm. immediately. Okay. What it is now, this is first station out. Mm -hmm. But these the volunteers of wherever the area is get paged out. They just have the backup or primary, and they serve as backup to this mm -hmm. primary station. Mm -hmm. So, the answer you quit, is this the best? No. Is it the best that you could afford at that time? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, would, where would you go? Well, that looks like the most logical, or is this the most logical? Well. This would have to be a 12 hour. <clears throat> that has the capability of being 12 and 24 hour. <clears throat> this could be a 12 or 24 hour. Is that the most logical? No, it's one that needed to be built. We had the property, so we said we need to build it for that 
sleeping capability long term. That's how we got those two. Is Clydeville considered a sub? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a real nice station. It's oh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's yeah. one of the most mm -hmm. modern, latest built fire yeah, stations. I know that. And if you were to say, Mr. Chairman, you know, okay, I know that they're sleeping at headquarters right now where headquarters is, but is there a better place to house those paid staff that we do have? I think that even though they're not buried in one of those high concentrations, what we have heard from them is that being at Perimeter Road in 84 where they are, they're in a good place to go either way. Go either way. Plus, Naylor is one of the locations that we have the least number of firefighters, and that's pretty much always been the case, and they're closest to Naylor to be able to get out and help with that. So I think that logistically, we probably have the paid people that we do have in, in the best spot for, uh, for our company. Well, <coughs> and, and I'm, I'm just throwing stuff out. But forgive me if it seems to get discombobulated. But let's take a scenario that we were going to take these two additional stations that you recommended, the Bema station and that would be the Clydeville station that has the capabilities of sleep. Yes. Okay. If we took those two stations and let's just say to begin to move to enhance the, the, the response time from fire departments to those areas, if we added, I'm just throwing a number out, I don't know if it would be the right number, but if we put three full-time people on either 12-hour shifts or 24-hour shifts in each one of those stations, they're still under the direction, full direction, employees of the county, by the chief out of the headquarters, so that when that call goes out, we've got trucks and three men, or women, excuse me, that will respond to that fire or to that accident that's in that general area rather than coming all the way from the headquarters as the primary first out first called out there. So can we better serve the county by looking the system by looking at a standpoint of can we take those two facilities and put a, 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 let's I call it a skeleton crew. We don't have to be how many how many on a ship roughly do we have? At so the, you need four to, to meet NFPA standards. Okay. You need four people on a truck. Okay. Um, there is there is a thought process out there that says you can you can get away with three, um, and that's great if you also have volunteers that can show up at the fire. Well, you would. But the problem that sometimes you have is that it's just a time of the day or it's in a particular district where we don't have as many, and and they're really late getting there if they do get there. Um, and if you have, for instance, a structure fire, you've got one firefighter on the call, you've got two people on the hose in the fire, and there should be a safety person outside that fire that's communicating between the two. So if you just roll three, you can get into a situation where things can get a little squirrely. But what we have talked about along that same line is if we, if we hire you know, two and two or, or three and three, what we see is that our volunteer, our paid firefighters are coming from our volunteer pool, which is good because that's creating full-time jobs. We have people who have, you know, been volunteers that now, if they can afford to that's and that's good. what they want to do, then the, so we do see the majority of them coming from the volunteers. But we also have a lot of volunteers that because of the other shift work that they work, they have additional hours that they can be available. Um, but sometimes it can be difficult for them too. Like for instance, Chad and I were getting some boss pictures the other day and we were in like park and the aerial <laughs> rolled out of Twin Lakes in response um, and there was only one person on the truck. And, and I'm sure he did that because he knew other people were responding as well and he was bringing the apparatus, but that's not ideal. But if you put two and two or three and three and then you made a part-time position available for the volunteers to add to that shift, we could get four people on a truck without having to hire four full-time people and you're giving volunteers even more hours to work and train them in that paid shift process with was is in line with the vision of the county and the perspective of that fire chief so that you've got an even more valuable labor pool yeah. as far as volunteers go. Well, what you're talking about is the logistics of how you man the stations. What I'm trying to look at at this point is that theoretically, 
can we can we best serve the citizens by manning Bemis and Clarkville stations? That's what they were built for. Can we best serve the citizens by moving toward manning those stations with the, whatever the personnel would be, whether it would be part-time volunteers or what have you? Um, I know that volunteers have their limited availability, and I go back again to practical experience. I like to call it my fireman. The one we have, I don't want him to stop in the middle of a job he's working for me because he gets a pager to run a fire. But you have been very good to let them do that. I understand that, but it's a difficult thing to do. Sure. And it's also a difficult thing for me to get a call from a homeowner to say, hey, where did your installer go? He just took off out of here like a bullet. You know? like, like something's on fire. Yeah, like something, well, it was. He got a call. You know, so reality is, is that how do you, how do you marriage all that together? And I do think that from your standpoint, that Joe standpoint of how you put it together to man it, I think is your task. I think that decision, in my opinion, should be your task. That's not our business. Our business as a commission is to try to make a decision of do we feel like if the citizens can be better served and do we need to make that move to these manned fire stations. Now, whether we do it this year, whether we give Mr. Pritchard direction to say, okay, budget time's coming up, we need you to be thinking about what that cost would be to do that so that we can make a decision. And the first thing we got to determine is, is there a need? Yeah, let's, let's look at, if we could get some more information on when the actual calls came in, as far as the time of day. Mm -hmm. And if we've got, let's just say, 65% of these calls came in from 7 to 7, then we could probably do what we want to do with two 12-man stations and serve, serve the public better. 12-hour stations. Yeah, 12-hour mm -hmm. stations. Mm -hmm. Now, if these calls are 50-50 split, you know, then we might look at 24-hour station. But if we look, go back and look at these, and I think what you're going to find, you probably find that most, not I'm going to say majority of them, are probably from that 7-7 seven seven time frame. And that, I would say the statistics, in my thinking, would support the fact that it is from 7-7, seven to seven, because typically, the most of your calls or a big part of your calls are going to be basically uh, accidents, cooking calls, unattended cooking, and those sort of things. When does that typically happen? Seven to seven. So if you look at the availability, and we have looked at this to some extent, we've not gotten super specific as far as when the calls come in because you can talk about chicken or the egg, really for us, it's how many people do we have to get there at what particular right. time. So you have um, in the evenings, um, most everybody's home from work. So we have a fairly good response from volunteers later in the day through the evenings through the night. Where that starts to drop off is around midnight or after. You have people who say, well, if I go off and get on a structure fire now that could be six hours long, I got to get up and go to work at six o'clock, and I got to be there. So it doesn't bother my fire. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't run this call because I might not, you know, be able to to get back. Well, listen about that too. We did look to see when. So it's during the daytime hours that the. Yeah, Y'all are talking about two. I think two different seven to seven. 7 a.m. 7 p.m. Not 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I'm talking 7 p.m. to a.m. I was awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. I thought. 7 a.m. to 7 To me, that covers, that covers most part of the time when people are at home and and cooking. I mean, that's when a lot of times you're going to have fires. And that's that, that time is when the volunteers are traditionally at work. So we have a we have a less turnout of volunteers during early morning and daytime hours. The later you get in the day, the more your volunteer response is going to be because people either start to get off work and can respond or they're, you know, they're already off. So, but there's really, I don't think that there's, there's going to be anything hard down that's not influenced by either the time of the year it is or the travel season that's going to tell you that there's a particular time of day that we get more calls. Why wouldn't we want to find a fire chief first and get his input on I think we need to have more information before we make a decision on how we want to progress. I, I would ask that y'all do this. Call 
get me. Your collective or your individual feedback as it relates to a fire chief. Is it relates to a fire chief? Yeah. Please. I don't, I'm afraid you've lost me. Um, what do we expect out of a fire chief? Well, I'd like your feedback on that, but that that selection of that individual has to rest with one. Oh, it does. Yes, yes, it does. And, that, and that's, that's the reason I question your question is because <laughs> yeah. it's not it's our not, decision. Yeah. That decision is your responsibility for you to hire the fire chief that you feel like that would best do the job. Now, are you going to find a perfect fire chief? Well, I'm a perfect clerk, uh, so I'll be close. <laughs> I think found I found a, you. And he found a pretty daggum good water sewer guy. For his yeah, I mean, but, but back to your question is, is back to what your statement. And I, I mean, here's where we're at. We have an interim fire chief right now that is also our EMA director, a grant writer. He's wearing many hats at this point in time right now. Um, reality is, is that is he comfortable right now doing what he's doing? If he's not, he's been the interim now for over a year. Then there's some rationale behind making a decision and not having, and please don't think that it's one of those, we got to make a rash, an irrational decision to hire a fireman to call to him. But he's done a lot by acting as the interim for over a year. Uh, that apparently, and, I, and I'm make, I haven't talked to him, but apparently it's not a job that he wants to pursue or he would have made application for that job. Okay. So he's, we know he don't want to be the fire chief. Now that's my point. I don't want somebody filling a role that's important as fire chief. One of our major services that we provide by somebody who, not that he's not doing a good job, but by somebody who has no aspiration. Yeah, he doesn't. I mean, and, and that's clear, in my opinion. So the point is, then, is that we've got, we got to try to find a fire chief. I just, I, I just want to say that y'all are making some assumptions that are not necessarily accurate. Okay. I, 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 I started out saying I'm kind of ignorant of this. I don't know what the assumption would be. Not, You're yeah. making the assumption that he does not want the position. He was told from the beginning, do not apply. Oh, I, I did. I made that assumption. Based on Based some on circumstances that. and issues at that time. Now, as those change and things have happened, I'm evaluating what we're going to be able, what I'm going to recommend to you guys as I move forward on this. But it would be incorrect to say he has no interest. He was told by me for that reason. So, uh, I, 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 I did not know that. I thought he, he, he liked what he was doing and he didn't want to hit, go as a fire chief. My conversation with him was that he enjoyed his job and asked him if he was going to order his sister, he said, soon. Is yes. it feasible for him to act in both parties? Yes, it's feasible because to do that. When we had the hurricane, this one right here was sending me the same EMS, EMS stuff. Well, and then a little bit later, I get it from Ashley. Did y'all get that? that? There are a number of individuals. If y'all go back, Commissioner Evans is the best resource on this. When we did a reduction in force, I had to move some responsibilities and some uh, requirements from one individual to another, who assumed more than one responsibility. Paige is clerk, 
pages of public information. She started out in HR and then I gave her the responsibility of public information on a trial basis. She's doing it right. <laughs> so from there it became a need in the clerk's office. So she still is a resource through HR not responsible for HR, but for public information. Now you have already seen the, uh, the uh, animal shelter and Target Zero and so forth. Can I hire people to do all those other things? Yeah. Yeah. Y'all just let me know how high you want the tax uh, millage to go, and I'll I'll be happy to do that. Or I can try to get the most efficient and effective form of government that we can have. I can go either way, Mr. depending on what y'all tell me. I'm going to take the You're on a slippery slope. And that slippery slope is, is that you're asking these commissioners to give you input on who you hire to no, hire sir. chief. No, sir. I don't want their input on who you hire. Thank you. What? What they're looking for. We're looking for a fire chief that you feel like that will be able to do the job of the fire chief for Lowndes County. And I know that that's very broad brush, but you know better than any of these commissioners sitting around here what that responsibility is as the fire chief for Lowndes County. You know what the challenges as well are of a fire chief that, that would have to work with a volunteer fire force and a paid fire force. Correct. The only reason I mentioned what I did was if going to Scotty's comment, well, shouldn't we be hiring somebody first? The, this whole discussion began with Commissioner Evans saying, well, what are we doing on the fire chief? Well, the smart aleck answer is I'm hiring somebody at some point in time. Trust me, rest easy, we'll hire But this feeds into what what question is and what Scotty said. So if y'all want to give me your input on that as to what you think is important, I will be evaluating all that in the selection process. And that may sound smart aleck or, or arrogant. I don't mean it to be that way. I'm just saying it, that that is a process that is ongoing from staffing standpoint this is, tell me what direction you want to go for a fire department. The individual that I select will be tasked with what you tell me you want as a fire department, not who. I, I think that would be the case regardless of who that individual is because that's the charges you're going to put on them. But, and, and we're going to leave the fire chief alone because, again, that's your job and your responsibility. What we need to make a decision on, based on what I've seen here, is that as a commission, do we feel like that we need an additional staff fire station or fire stations to better serve the citizens in Lowndes County based on the information that you've been providing? I'd say any time we could, the question, I agree, that, that's, that's, that's the ultimate of the question. The question is, can we afford a better, better service because we, you know, we could add two stations and provide a better service. We don't. We know. add ten stations and provide an even better service. We don't know until we give Mr. Pritchett that direction, and then he comes back with us and say, "Okay, this is what you've asked for. Now, this is what it's going to cost. Do you want to continue to go down this path?" But I think first off, we have to make a decision of whether or not the need is there. The need is okay. So the question is not. The question then is not at this point of of uh, do we do it, we've determined that there is a need. Now we need to give direction to Mr. Pritchard to get the information to see it, to see if it is something that we can financially support at this time. If not, we make it part of our vision and our long-term goals to say we eventually want multiple fire stations in Lowndes County this is where we believe, based on the statistical information that we see, where those stations need to be located. And then when we can work in that direction, we get there. 
I feel like all I'm qualified to say is that yes, I think that we should, we would be foolish not to have a desire and a vision to, to enhance and increase the level of service to our citizens related to fire. But as far as saying based on the data, this, that, I feel like, again, I don't want Mr. Pritchard to put his 15 and a half over here on my leg, but I feel like it goes back to like before we hired Steve. I mean, if you have, you know, well, well, we can see that there's a gap in the water system there. Okay, well, let's, let's start making arrangements to tie all this water together before we have a professional in that role that can that really is better suited to advise us on those decisions. Because I don't know if manning one by where all those accidents are, occur are occurring is the best option or not. Well, so I say again broadly that if we, can, if we can provide a better level of service and figure out how to pay for it, I'm all in. And, and, and that really is, it, is really what I'm saying. I mean, we're, we're using as examples the Bema station and the Clydeville station because they currently have sleeping quarters. If you do anything different than those two fire stations, then you've got to build a new facility so that there's adequate sleeping quarters for the fire. If you do a 24-hour station, if you only do a 12-hour station, then you don't. Yeah. Right? For a what? What I take is, uh, as y'all's direction is to provide the highest level of fire service that we can um, based on the costs associated. So that y'all are given that and y'all determine then what you feel that the public is willing to afford. I, I think that that's extremely important because I, I will say this, I think it's important that we keep in the back of our mind that even if there is an increase in the cost of firefighting, the decisions that we make as we, as we get this information of what that cost is going to be, we can then make the determination of whether or not, how, you know, how we're going to fund it. Do we do it as an overall tax increase if, re if required? I mean, if it, in, if it requires us to increase the millage for that additional funding, do we do it by fire districts? You can't do it. You can't increase the millage for it unless you made the unincorporated area its own <coughs> separate district because it has. They have to be funded through the special services. Well, then that's that's what we do. <coughs> but even the making the whole unincorporated area of Lowndes County as a special fire district, or do we actually look at District Two as a fire district and District Three as a fire district? Do we do that? I mean, I think those are the bridges that, you know, those are the discussions that's going to have to be had later on. But I think at this point, if it, it, it's our job to look at this just from just what I see here, are we getting the, the and I hate to say adequate, because adequate could be anything from good to bad, but dollar for dollar. Dollar for dollar is the value there for us to serve the citizens in Lowndes County with better fire protection, which would equate to a lower ISO rating for those areas because we're serving them in a different manner, a quicker response time than what we're currently serving from the station team. Am I correct to assume that the higher level of service also equates to a consistent or lower ISO rating. And the reason I say consistent or lower, the cost of going uh, from a four to a three is significantly more than going from a nine to a five. Your savings from your insurance premium diminishes as your cost fire service increases. So there is a, a, a point where you have a diminishing return on the reduction of, fire, of um, lowering your fire service, uh, ISO rate versus the savings and the increasing cost. Is it, is it realistic to believe that Lowndes County can get to an ISO rating of one? No, that's unrealistic. My, my can we go from a nine to a five? Realistic. My realistic increase of service would be more related to response time than, than equipment or whatever versus the 
versus the ISO rating at this point? Because I think that would be a long-term goal. That's a benefit that you hit out of improving it. I agree. But like just the cost quit. of reduction of an ISO rating is something that we can't say that's our goal for the next year. To I think you will. Uh, I think you will realize that if not in the next year, the next couple of years, eventually Lowndes County will have to give serious consideration to service areas, whether it be solid waste or whether it be fire protection or other levels of service, that is a possible alternative down the road. But I think this commission or future commissions will have to consider as a viable means of addressing this because there is a limitation on what you're going to be able to do uh, from a property tax increase, certainly based on what Jason showed y'all from the uh, tax property evaluation. And I agree. I, I mean, that, that's a great statement from the standpoint of what is the decisions that's going to be have to be made down the road. But I think, and it's not necessarily today, but at least by looking at this, I mean, it kind of clears me in the face to say that we have a need to do to begin to move in a in a different direction with fire protection for the citizens of Lounge County. But that's Anything else that y'all would like to discuss concerning this is code enforcement. I know that we talked about litter and things related to that. I just thought if you want to see um <clears throat> where similar to the last time. Yeah, where yeah. our code enforcement calls are. Pretty much the same um, places. Then um where is Bob Langdale's place? <laughs> <laughs> See where is the largest clump of darkness? <laughs> um, if there are no questions concerning that, um, we'll take a break.